much, uh, my dear friend, Maria Fernanda Espinoza. It is such an honor and pleasure for me personally to see you chairing this very important uh, meeting today. Uh, Madam Chair, I want to thank all the distinguished speakers for their active and constructive participation in this important webinar. For the sake of the time allocated uh, for uh, the meeting, let me highlight some key elements and remarks, closing remarks, as you have rightly pointed out. We all agreed that the pandemic of COVID-19 and its impacts poses a global humanitarian, economic, and social challenge that transcends the boundaries of the current time stage with all its tragedies and difficulties. There is no doubt that the continued imposition of unilateral coercive measures is one of the serious gaps in building global collective measures in one of the serious on two basic steps. Uh, sorry, is one is one of the serious gaps in building global collective solidarity, which should be based on two basic steps. First is strengthening the capabilities of all countries equally and without exception. And second is activating the tools of multilateral preventive diplomacy. In the face of unfolding COVID-19 pandemic emergency, many statements and appeals have been issued by United Nations senior officials and groups and forums led by the UN Secretary General the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Special Rapporteur, Mrs. Duan, the Group of 77 and China, the Non-Aligned Movement, more than 44 UN organizations and international bodies, all of which have urged for lifting unilateral sanctions that obstruct the humanitarian responses of sanctioned states in order to enable their health care systems to fight the COVID-19 pandemic and save lives, and alarming the international community that these coercive measures impede and undermine the essential cooperation and solidarity that should prevail among nations. Unfortunately, instead of taking immediate measures to lift or at least suspend coercive measures on the Syrian people, the EU decided to prolong its restrictive measures until June 1, 2021. And the US president sent a letter to the Congress announcing that he is renewing also US sanctions against Syrian people. In addition to imposing a new and tightening the already imposed sanctions on the Syrian people by activating what's so, the what's so called Caesar Act, which will come into effect in the current June, as you know. Let me just affirm here the fact that all recent US and EU statements and fact sheets regarding alleged exemptions and exceptions for humanitarian assistance and trade in order to reduce the profound impact of these illegal punitive measures on the Syrian people and on the peoples of other countries are merely irresponsible and misleading attempt to cover up the crimes and violations of these parties against the sovereignty, independence, safety and territorial integrity of the Syrian Arab Republic, and against the security, peace, stability and prosperity of the Syrian people. Having said that, our colleagues from the EU perfectly know that the Syrian banking system is fully blocked from any foreign transactions because of EU and US illegal sanctions. And they perfectly know that the, the EU banks have put their hands on Syrian assets, which were dedicated to bring food and medicines to Syria. And they perfectly know that we cannot rebuild our electricity power stations, which were destroyed by Daesh and Al Qaeda because of the EU and the US sanctions. They are doing in Syria exactly what they are doing to Venezuela. I did not want this important session to turn into confrontation with other participants. The facts are clear, and I would only tell our colleague from France, 
for instance, that his government was and still involved in supporting terrorism and destruction in my country, Syria. So they lost any legal and moral qualification to speak or evaluate the situation in my country or desperately try to find baseless legal framework for EU sanctions on the Syrian people. I have sent during the past three months more than 10 letters on behalf of my government to the Secretary General, the President of the General Assembly, and the President of the Security Council, in which I explained the profound impact of these unilateral sanctions on the life of every Syrian citizen inside Syria. I included in those letters evidence and statistics proving that these sanctions affect all economic, agricultural, industrial, banking, investment and service sectors in Syria. In parallel to imposing economic terrorism, this is how we call it, this is how it, we qualify it, it's an economic terrorism on any foreign party trying to enter Syria to contribute to the reconstruction and early recovery process. I would like to remind your good self here of the systematic policy pursued by the United States and the European Union of preventing the United Nations Development System, UNDP, from launching the reconstruction process in Syria after a decade-long terrorist war. In conclusion, Madam Chair, we will continue to advocate the rights and aspiration of the Syrian people and the peoples of many countries of the world who has exceeded 2 billion and are subject to these illegal measures, along with the support of the distinguished UN officials and activists, like the respected speakers who enriched our discussion today. I am confident that placing a priority on the profound impacts of these coercive measures on the global fight against COVID-19 will alert the international community to the fact that the failure to achieve global collective solidarity will raise justified doubts about the effectiveness or, or even the existence of a global multilateral system and about the capability of the United Nations system of putting an end to such a lawful embargo or limiting its profound if effects on the peoples of the world and on sustainable development. I thank you very much, Madam Chair. I thank